privacy, ownership, and security. Um, well, some subtopics within these really large concepts. So we have an amazing panel here today. We have Stefan Daniel um, at uh, DNA Partners. Uh, we have uh, Arnaud Tw uh, Twati at uh, Hashtag Avocats. We have um, Mathieu Kinu at Legal Brain. Uh, he's also a senior lecturer at uh, University Paris 8 uh, and a co-founder at ATO. And you, you can maybe tell us a little bit more about that uh, when it's your turn. Um, and we have uh, Gabrielle uh, Jacquard, who is CEO and founding partner at Arbitri Law Firm. So let's start with the concept of uh, decentralization. So decentralization is an ideal that we're working towards within the Web3 community. But can it be achieved? Um, and how can, and Stefan will walk us through, you know, how can uh, foundations and DAOs achieve decentralization? Is it possible? Um, so go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Olga. So with respect to decentralization, usually when we think about it, uh, we think about it in terms of technology and we apply it to distributed ledgers. So we think about decentralizing the nodes, uh, validating the transactions of the network. For the metaverse, it's a bit different because a metaverse could be built without blockchain technology. So what does it mean to decentralize a metaverse? Uh, in my opinion, we could think about it in two ways. Either we decentralize the decision-making power of the project which is uh, running the metaverse and at the same time distributing the value that is created by the metaverse to the users. So those two ways are basically the way we see now Web3, which uh, currently is very different from what we've seen so far. Uh, if we think about it, Web2 and classical projects uh, that were uh, run since then usually are held by private companies with uh, founders and shareholders. And the idea is to make, to make some profits and then to distribute those profits to the shareholders. With Web3, the idea is very different. The idea is to launch, to engage a large community of stakeholders and to decentralize the governance of projects and to share the value that is created with the participants to the ecosystem. And so with, with Web3, we are currently witnessing a very different way of structuring projects and financing them. It's completely different, different from what we've seen so far. So the question now, from a legal perspective, is how do we structure those projects which are decentralized? At DNA Partners, we are currently framing the first DAOs under French law, and but before doing so, uh, we have run a benchmark to see what was done by the biggest DAOs uh, that we already know, like Uniswap, uh, Compound, Aave, and stuff like that. The idea, when we had this benchmark, is that we've seen uh, that some of those projects didn't have any kind of legal structures, whereas others had either a company with just the founders and a DAO, or sometime, which we think is the best way to approach it, is to have the founders with <laughs> one single company to protect their interest, to offer them private, uh, limited liability, and to have a non-profit entity next to it, which could be in the form of a foundation or an association, with uh, the aim of holding the IP to the protocol and to finance the development of the DAO. So in this way, we think that having those two structures is the most efficient way of structuring DAOs, structuring Web3 projects. And what kind of decision-making power or governance do you think should be kept uh, at the sort of at a centralized level at the top of these organizations and what should be handed out? And, and is that then true decentralization? The, the question is funny because the answer could be different at depending on the stage where you are in the project. Uh, there is a very famous article that has been written by, uh, it, that is actually accessible on the, on the blog of A16, uh, which, says, which is called Exit to Community. At first, of course, the project is centralized because you have a group of founders which is limited, which aim is to develop a first project to find some kind of product market fit and slowly but surely then trying to decentralize the governance of the project by uh, constructing a community around the project. And then, of course, the ultimate point is what's called the exit to community, which is basically done through uh, either a public sale or an airdrop of governance token 
And of course, uh, in the long run, the idea is to have a complete decentralized entity. So the answer really depends on, on where you are in the project. But how do you have you know, KYC know your customer regulations and other regulatory um, uh, requirements met by these organizations if they're run at, at a decentralized uh, you know, level? How does that happen? It, it is actually for our clients a big issue because most, if not all, DeFi projects are permissionless. So anybody with just a wallet can connect to the interface and interact with the protocol. And there is no KYC. Uh, so this is for DeFi projects. When we structure a project at first, it's small. We have, as I said, the private company and the association or the foundation, whatever. It's easy to identify who's, who's collaborating. So to, co to, to have contract, you need to know with whom you are contracting with. Uh, if you are getting finance, you need to know who's your investor, right? So here we can have KYC. But ultimately, the protocol which is delivered to the public, there won't be any KYC on it because blockchain is permissionless. But so last question for you, you know, how does uh, there are, you know, more and more countries uh, are putting in regulations about every company has to know, know their customer. You have to do reporting to the government. How does that play into kind of what we want versus what's now required? It's a very uh, pain point for, 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 let's say, Web3 founders, because if you look now for NFTs and for DeFi, there is no KYC at all. Uh, only on centralized projects, for example, centralized exchanges, you will have KYC. So now we have like a duality of project where some are, are using KYC and others are not doing it. For now, under French law, for example, the only, uh, the only obligation you have to use KYC is when you are registered as a virtual asset service provider. This is the only moment when you have to apply KYC. Other, other than that, even if you do an ICO, if you do an F NFT drop, if you, if you operate a DeFi project, you don't, you don't have a formal obligation to perform a KYC. Of course, we'll see in time. I think the, the answer lies not from a, in the legal concepts, but in technological concepts, i.e. when we will be uh, able to attach identity to wallets uh, with uh, especially Z ZK rollups, uh, that will be very interesting because we'll be able to participate to DeFi projects without giving our identity, but having done the KYC. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Olga, sorry, just, just one thing to, to add maybe uh, to, to Daniel, what just Daniel said. Hello, everybody. Um, there is, it's true, no uh, legal obligation to have a KYC in such kind of project. That's absolutely true. Um, however, uh, the, from a tax perspective especially, uh, it's very important to have a KYC anyway because we, we actually don't know how to apply the VAT if we don't know the origin of the funds, especially the nationality of the investors. And there is another um, question when we are talking about KYC, I guess, this is the bank. Because as we know, all of us here, uh, it's going to be very complicated for a blockchain project to have a bank account which actually accept to convert cryptocurrencies in euros if we don't have, if the project doesn't have a KYC before. So technically, that's absolutely true. There is no obligation in such projects to have a KYC. But technically, considering tax perspective and banking perspectives, KYC is actually pretty much mandatory. Yes, thank you for that. So I, I, I forgot to introduce myself. So I'm Olga Baskatova, and my company is Next Stage Advisory, and I do accounting uh, for Web3 companies. And so tax, obviously, in any sort of money operations, it's, it's what I do. So that's why uh, this, uh, this comment is uh, very um, pertinent, and, and I think it's very true. But so since you started speaking, uh, I would love uh, for you to go into the next topic, which is uh, you know, d uh, data privacy, right? So as we're, especially when there's KYC involved, right? So again, know your customer laws. Uh, and again, banks and uh, tax jurisdictions require us to report, right? And, uh, and know who we're dealing with, especially for anti-money laundering uh, rules, for example. So now we're giving up all this information uh, to all these, you know, say metaverse, uh, whether it's a foundation, a DAO right, or a company, um, what what does that mean for us, right? So we, you know, we're also at the same time we've been trying to protect our data. Uh, uh, there's GDPR laws, right, that have come out. Um, other laws, uh, ac you know, across the world. What? How do we do that in Web three? As you know, companies like Meta, they're trying to become the where we are socially, we where we are work wise and have offices there, right? So they're they're going to connect to our wallets, know everything that we do. 
how do we protect ourselves? That's a good question. Uh, I'm not too sure to know the answer. Um, the point is like, um, well, when uh, when Olga introduced this this panel and asked us uh, what are for us the main uh, legal, let's say, the legal problems we can have in the metaverse, I immediately answered that there is for me uh, potentially problems uh, in data privacy relating to metaverse. Uh, why? Because, um, I mean, um, in Europe, and I guess in the United States, uh, we are not used to have, you know, like what we call, like, you know, this huge app which cover a lot of different data. We, we much more have, like, different applications separate from one to another. And with the metaverse, uh, we will be much closer to, the, as for me, to, to the China mindset, uh, and we will have potentially ability to aggregate uh, so much data that we can even imagine. And at the same time, when I'm trying to read and understand uh, you actually were talking about meta and what's the the way of thinking of of Mark Zuckerberg, especially, of course, not the only one, but uh, he, he has an influence anyway uh, in this uh, in this market. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit scary, uh, and I will explain you why I think we should be very careful about it. Okay, so let's say you are going to uh, the metaverse with your headsets, uh, you have high tracking, uh, the quality and the resolution is very high. Uh, technically, who knows, they would be able to see what you actually see, to hear what you actually say, to technically to follow your path in the metaverse, exactly as we do in China with the camera and when you are going to a mall and actually we know exactly what you are going to buy one after one. Uh, and we will be so able to uh, understand and determine what you are, what you are going to buy because of course uh, this metaverse will ask you to use the coins of the metaverse. And then technically if we sum up, uh, the metaverse is able to see what you see, to hear what you hear, to follow your path, to have an access to your bank account on the metaverse. So technically they know pretty much everything on you, uh, about you. And, uh, and yes, uh, I think that if we, as a lawyer, as a, as, as a specialist in, in law, if we don't take care about that question, that, that could be a really huge problem. So ethic and law are for me the big concerns in the metaverse relating uh, to the to the data privacy. And so do you think that there's going to be regulation that comes out for web3 as well to protect uh, you know people's privacy? Well, uh, GDPR regulations is already here and uh, it's it's pretty tough regulation and uh, sometimes quite efficient, uh, but I'm afraid it will not be enough. Um, and and I think we will have to. I mean, we, we have this uh, this regulation. We have other regulations like DNA, DSA, uh, in in other subjects. But I think that uh, we need to reinforce uh, the legislation relating to the data privacy, applicated to the to the metaverse. Because what I said before, uh, the aggregation of data is like much more powerful that we know uh, we, we knew before and we need to adapt ourselves uh, very quickly uh, because there is for me a risk that we will not uh, masterize this subject anymore I, I think this is super scary I mean when I hear uh, these sort of you know descriptions I, I just I, it makes me want to just log off everything and so that no one can know what I'm doing but in this you know in in our world we uh, we're more and more plugged in online so I think it's so it's so pertinent to like our daily lives, right? How do we protect ourselves? Is there anything we can do now? Do we just not do business with these companies until they offer us privacy? There are a lot of metaverse uh, who are not, who don't want to do like this, of course. Uh, I, I was talking about meta, especially because I'm, you know, pointing out this metaverse because even if we know all of us here that there will be many metaverse and probably much uh, more respectable to the data privacy, uh, the, I think that we, we should choose the metaverse where we are going. Uh, and uh, that's the first thing. Uh, and the second, we need to be very careful about the way we use our data. Um, I don't think people are taking care about their data when they are going to Facebook. And despite the fact that the number of people in this social network decreasing very fast, there are still more than two billion people who are using Facebook. Which And, and I don't think they really understand uh, how they use, I mean, all of them understand exactly how they use the data. 
and I just wondering if uh, there is no risk to have the same situation for the metaverse. So I would say choose the metaverse which respects the data privacy as much as possible and be careful and take care about your data privacy. And what about, you know, we're talking about private companies, but what about if it's a state-run metaverse uh, or government having all this information? Is there anything we can do? Well, uh, I'm more afraid about the fact that this metaverse wants actually to set up states by themselves. I mean, uh, when you are, once again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm focusing on, on Zuckerberg because it's really interesting what he's explaining. Um, and he's just saying that the way, for, I mean, for him to set up a metaverse, it's the way to avoid any, technically, any regulation from the states. He's talking about DAO as well. Uh, I'm not sure that he's thinking about the DAO in the right way. But the point is, like, he, he wants to set up a state by himself. He wants to avoid any regulation, any rules. He wants to set up his own rules. So I would be more afraid by a concentration of big metaverse with a superpowers like that rather than metaverse from states themselves except maybe China but it's a very specific market with very specific history and rules and uh, I'm not sure it, it's really the subject uh, today even if this uh, Chinese metaverse maybe wants to uh, develop uh, their metaverse in Europe and, and United States as well we'll see that Interesting. Okay. But then it's up to us whether we want to join that or not. So I guess that's maybe the point we have to exercise, you know, we have to research and then exercise um, our right to join something or not, right? Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so um, I would like to ask you, uh, Mathieu, to maybe talk a little bit about um, how can companies help uh, offer data privacy? What are the tools that they can use to, um, you know, to help uh, protect uh, data? Um, of their users, um, and also, you know, we touched upon uh, earlier the concept of uh, how do we, you know, how do we even establish identity uh, or then prove that an asset belongs to somebody? And if you can talk about um, these these concepts as well. Thank you, Olga. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I think it's really important to to deal with identity and assets because when you are on this kind of well, new world, you will have to discover and to decide with who you want to, to deal with. And sometimes there is also a question related to AML, and you don't want to deal with uh, someone which is in fraud and be liable because you are using some, for example, a non-fungible token that was created as a counterfeiting. You don't want to use that on a metaverse, for example. You want to be sure that the artist uh, is the real one, and when he created the NFT, uh, he has the right to do it. So, in a way, you don't want to share many d personal data, but in another way, you want to be sure of the origin of the assets. So, we have to find the right balance between the two aspects, and uh, before we we talk about uh, the ZK rollup and uh, zero knowledge proof, uh, in a way, it's quite interesting to, to follow this path. Uh, it's still new, uh, but the idea behind is maybe interesting because um, if you've got personal data and you don't want to share it, uh, how can you prove that you are the artist? How can you prove you've got such an asset and you are uh, lawful? Um, you have to technically propose something on the web and it's ZK, Z, ZK ZKP, um, in a way that uh, zero knowledge proof can prove something, prove, a, for example, that you have more than 18, that you have the right to buy this stuff, uh, that you are not uh, uh, irregularly uh, uh, entering a metaverse or stuff like that. So it's quite interesting to have this aspect, this proof, but without revealing the data. So for identity, maybe in a decentralized way, it's a more interesting, but I think that, well, in Europe especially, uh, we are going to have new systems uh, like, uh, well, digital passports uh, that will be proposed by HIDAS2, a new regulation. And so I think we won't really see ZKP because states want to keep control of their citizens. So maybe there is, a, well, two, two ways uh, that can be more web three and then they're more state-oriented. So for a metaverse that will be created by a state, 
Um, I think we will have a HIDAS2 and passports, that's for sure, and it's for digital twin, and it's quite important. And sometimes we've got problems related to the interoperability between decentralized metaverse, uh, well, editorial, uh, publisher metaverse, like uh, Meta, Facebook system, and the, the systems that are proposed by the states. Uh, for example, in France, we've got a, a city called Cannes, and they just made an auction to sell uh, La Croisette and other uh, really important uh, spots in Cannes uh, in an auction. And the, the guy that uh, buy it has the right to integrate La Croisette in the metaverse he wants. But if it's uh, in the metaverse, which is a digital twin and run by the state, it might be a real problem, I think, in terms of administration. So. We will see what will happen with this kind of well transfer of assets in this new systems that are not with clear boundaries at the moment. And what are companies doing right now to prevent fraud? Uh, you know, based on you know authenticity, right? So or lack of like how how do they authenticate people and assets and ownership? So you, you've got um, platforms that already have system of KYC for for example for NFT selling. Uh, it's not generalized, but you've got system like that. You also have systems that propose uh, terms and condition integrated into the metadata of the NFT, so you can be sure that you have uh, like an assignment of IP of several rights, and you are able to use it on a specific metaverse on Twitter as a profile picture, for example. Uh, otherwise, it can be console, uh, maybe. Because if you don't have a, a real object on the contract, then it's cancelable, and you well, you don't have really something tangible. Well, even if it's <laughs> digital, it's intangible, too intangible, because you don't have a thing that is uh, integrated into it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Gabrielle. Um, can you uh, so you know coming coming off uh, this topic? Um, can you talk a little bit more about how does contract law apply to Web3, um, especially when it's difficult to establish identity and ownership? Um, and then I think you wanted to talk a little bit about um, how Web3 actually helps protect rights um, of, of its stakeholders. So we would love to hear about that. Thank you very much. Uh, it's probably hard to top off the presentation of my esteemed colleague. Uh, just a small disclaimer. I'm, I'm from Switzerland, so I come from a different paradigm in terms of uh, regulation, that's for sure. And um, my goal as of today was really to discuss a little bit um, regulation and also you know, this contract law aspect. Um, because um, we saw more and more I in Europe, for example, we have the GDPR, we have law and regulation coming up all the time. Uh, that actually the law uh, that is being established by, by the state always has the same thing. Centralized, centralized, centralized. I want to have someone in control that I, I can license, that I can request, you know, everything. And um, I think in this regard, contract law can be very interesting because the whole goal of the contract law is to create this bilateral relationship without the, the, the intermediary. Uh, when we speak about the, the metaverse, uh, at some point there were some legal scholars that discussed the fact that, you know, um, the and it's funny because this is very cyclic. Um, we, we saw that there were some legal scholars discussing the fact that maybe, you know, a contract in the metaverse did not exist or etc. And this is a fundamental misconception of what contract law is. Contract law is not like writing a piece of paper and just like handing over this piece of paper and figuring out this is the contract. Contract law is a social construct. It's a social contract. So because we live in this, in this world, in this social world together, and the rule that applies to this, to this, uh, to this world is actually the law, because that's the, the law we actually give to each other. And we can find some uh, uh, great quotes from Montesquieu and from any others. Don't get, don't get me started on that. But I, b I believe that's an interesting topic to say that, you know, metaverse, all, that, all, all those places are just, you know, the, our new moon. It's a new space that we try to conquer, and what <laughs> we just figure out that law existed there. Um, so contract law being a very flexible tool to actually uh, uh, manage you know those uh, all those uh, those uh, relationship that you might have in the social world it's it will be very effective a very effective way to actually create uh, um, a legal relationship in the metaverse for nfts and stuff like that thing is you have to think it through beforehand because uh, 
I always have, you know, clients coming up and they, they are always like, oh, we're almost done with the project. Uh, let, uh, we're thinking about uh, the regulation. W what's up with that? They, and they all often forget that actually the regulation and the law is actually the layer zero of any blockchain. Stra having a strategy in place and knowing exactly where you go in terms of, uh, you know, regulation and what will be what I need to do to comply and what contract I need to pass in order to be secure from a legal point of view, even though I'm acting in this technical system. And we see in that point that we're very medieval because we have countries that works, you know, on a, on a land basis, whilst those, uh, those um, uh, blockchain are the first really international tool and, and, and technical tool that we have that kind of plans to, to aim for the international uh, internationality first. Um, so I wanted to discuss a little bit about uh, securitization and I was very interested by, by the, the DAO and I think, you know, uh, creating a DAO, securitizing, you know, rights, governance rights is a very interesting uh, use case. We have several use cases of uh, DAO association in Switzerland here and there. And I, I believe, you know, this, um, this uh, I saw a few use cases, for example, the sushi swap. They have this kind of governance system that works uh, uh, for their community. At some point, however, they kind of lack this kind of security from the law because they have never been organized under a legal DAO, even though they could have done so because there were some bill here and there in the US that actually enables that now. But I see that uh, that's one of the, the key points of, uh, of, uh, of what, what, I, what I would like to share with you today is really think about, think about regulating and think about also trying to give like a framework, a legal framework to what you do. And, you know, tokenizing, for instance, is governance token into this DAO can be a very viable way to actually achieve your purpose with a project and at the same time also um, being secure in a traditional uh, legal infrastructure kind of sense. So yeah, uh, I, I could I could speak up, but may, maybe you have a... Uh, you want to add something? Yeah. Okay. yeah, if I can just add a word. Uh, uh, um, the sentence you pronounced was quite fun when you said, we went into the metaverse and we discovered there was law. It's the same with DAOs, actually, because when people interact with DAOs, there is a risk. The risk is uh, in French, and I think in Switzerland as well, they, they, they talk about société créée de fait. Uh, they have the same concept in common law countries, which is general partnership. It means that even though you did not uh, incorporate any company, in fact, you are behaving as partners. So basically, you have created a partnership. And this means that if you have a DAOs without any kind of legal structures, anyone, a regulator, the tax administration, I don't know, a claimant, could go after you saying, guys, you have created a partnership and you're the partner. So now, uh, I am suing you, and I am asking you to do this or that. P and personally. this is the biggest risk, actually. I, and suing you personally. And this yes. personal and liability, unlimited uh, liability for all stakeholders, and there is a use case currently <laughs> in the US about that, that. That's true, and the worst thing is that there is also joint and several liability between the partners. So it, this means that if one of the partner be interested <laughs> in the law. <laughs> But again, we, we, are, we are doing the, the circle here, but going back again to, to DAOs, it's really important to, 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 to legally structure them to, to, to protect founders. That's the most, when, as a lawyer, when we receive clients and they want to launch a DAO, we say, okay guys, but think about the way you want to structure it because the risks are really, really high. Yeah. And uh, from a tax perspective, to add to that, at least uh, in the US, if you are a partnership, um, uh, any company that's a partnership or DAOs that are created as partnerships, every single partner is liable for taxes wherever that DAO is doing business. So it could be international, you know, where we have 50 states in America. If, you're, if you have users in every one of those states, all of a sudden, each one of these partners has to file taxes there, um, you know, or in any country. So it's just so important to think about that. But do we, I'm not sure how much time we have left. I think we have a few minutes. We would love to open it up for Q&A if you guys have questions. Anybody? Is uh, Bitcoin uh, GDPR compliant? Anybody? No? Okay. So then I have a question. We have a few minutes left? Yeah. yeah? Five minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay. So we, we spoke about, uh, if you guys change your minds, you know, just raise your hand, right? Um, you know, we, we started talking about 
uh, companies operating across different countries. So, and I think, you know, and then this concept of like, this is a moon and there are no, there are no laws there. And there is a lot of that that I'm seeing out there. And of course, laws apply, existing laws apply. This is not, even if it's another planet, we're all still the same and we're still people, we're still citizens of certain countries. Uh, how do companies, what's your advice across you know, your spectrums for companies that are going out there and they're just starting to operate globally? What does that mean for, you know, in terms of, like, from a legal perspective? Uh, I think for contractual law, we can have, uh, well, choice of law. So it's possible to decide, for example, if you are in France and you are dealing with a company in Korea, to choose a French law, for example. So for this aspect, it's quite easy to deal with. Uh, but for uh, security and regulation and compliance, it's way harder because it depends on the consumer you are dealing with. And then you will have to, to apply specific regulation to comply with uh, SEC, uh, IMF in France, and other, uh, well, uh, authority and it's quite hard to deal with that and so sometimes as we've done before with ICO and we are still doing uh, it's really important to exclude some countries for example China it's generally excluded when you have to propose an ICO uh, when you want to do some well uh, specific communication uh, to French people and you don't have a IMF visa then you will have to well do it another way and maybe not directly uh, communicate to them. Uh. May, I, may I add to that? Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the, the key points is, uh, so again, we live in a medieval world and that's why, you know, we have to apply to each and everyone. But you can actually avoid that by also targeting. If you don't have like a targeted activity, especially with ICO, you have like uh, the SEC uh, jurisprudence about that. You you can like put the disclaimer, put some measure in place, technical measure especially that just avoid and exclude you know some jurisdiction, and you're pretty much golden. Uh, truth is, you know, we live in also in a time of arbitrage. There are some people that wants to go to Seychelles to launch like a very project. The truth is, they get stuck in Seychelles. And I mean, Seychelles is fine. <laughs> I would love to to get tan there, but not ha maybe have my money stuck there. Um, and the the thing is, um, I, b I believe it's um, there is like lots of arbitrage, but uh, in the end. Uh, you can really try to, uh, if you're a founder, I would suggest really to market and to target some so your activities towards selected uh, market and make sure again that, you know, from a regulatory uh, standpoint, you're clean. And uh, maybe also um, life and like companies, like a step-by-step -step basis. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think personally that whenever somebody's thinking of uh, founding a Web3 company, the first thing you should do is hire a lawyer. Uh, because there are so many different um, <laughs> issues that you can run into, um, so it's so important to talk about, you know, how, what, ki what, what's the, where are you founding this company, right? And and what is the entity that you're creating, and how is it going to operate um, across, you know, in that jurisdiction and across other jurisdictions? Um, or no, did you want to add something? Mm, actually, regarding the, the, the yeah, okay. Oh. okay, you guys have a question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how do you see re regulation and compliance? Because we're talking about France, but Europe. So all platforms are, are international because it's, it's internet. So are we going to make it uh, just one regulation? Or will we have regulation per metaverse, per country, per group of countries? How, how do you see it in the future? I don't know if the question is for yeah. me. Okay. It's for all, right. Yeah. all right. All right. Um, well, um, first we have MICA, so European regulation, so that's for sure a regulation which will cover the 27 countries of uh, the European Union. Um, and I think that uh, we, I don't think we are going to have regulation per countries because it's a global subject. Well, so there are going to be MICA, of course. Um, I'm sure that United States will uh, continue and pursue their uh, wish to, to regulate uh, this sector as well, for many reason, uh, reasons. And uh, there is China as well, uh, which wants to regulate it very, very strongly. Uh, so I'm... To answer your question, I'm not sure we're going to have different regulation per countries, but more question of big blocks, uh, Europe, 
uh, United States, China, and maybe some countries like Russia for reasons I don't need to sum up today, but which will help them for different reasons. Um, uh, so I don't know if uh, I answer your question, but big blocks and not regulations per countries. Thank you. Anybody else wants to add to that? Maybe the, there will be, uh, at the international level, there will be standards, technical standards, because that applies at international level. So you will have probably some, uh, you know, some uh, standards that will apply everywhere, and then you will have eventually people complying about that. And actually also that's one of the beauty of blockchain, it's about being also open source. So everyone can actually, you know, fork and use it. But from a regulatory, st a regulatory standpoint, I, I fully agree with uh, what Anna said. But to wrap it up, I think uh, from a tax point, uh, because every government wants to collect its own taxes, right, and everybody's economy is separate, I think that tax laws will always be separate. And any company that's looking to deal, um, you know, in, in across countries needs to uh, hire tax attorneys and uh, look at the, look at the um, their requirements for taxes. Uh, and I think those will always be country specific, uh, in my opinion. Um, because there's no way to share a pot of money. No one likes to share. Um, so, and that wraps up our panel. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, and thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>